Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Sarah Squire from Liberty Fund, and I am here with Caroline Brashears, Professor of English at St. Lawrence University, and with Steve Horwitz, Distinguished Professor of Free Enterprise at Ball State University. And we're here today to talk about one of my favorite books, Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. Um, this is part of a project that we're trying at the Online Library of Liberty, where we bring together professors from very different uh, academic departments to talk about works that we think are of interest to both of them at once. I think that Sense and Sensibility is uniquely suited for this kind of approach. Um, Jane Austen's novels have received a lot of attention lately from the economics department, and they are longstanding favorites of English departments. Um, but also, I think that the title of Sense and Sensibility reflects a lot of the things that we think about, a lot of the biases that we have about these two different academic disciplines. We've got economics, the sensible ones, common sense, cold hard facts, logic, data. And we've got sensibility in the English department, emotion, reaction, sort of vibrating to the emotional strings of the universe. So I think that the question that I want to start by asking the two of you is whether you think that that sort of preconception accurately or inaccurately reflects your discipline and what you do, and whether you think that that distinction is mirrored in Austen's novel. How separate really are her characters who have good sense and her characters who have a lot of sensibility. So I'm going to ask that and I'm going to lean back and let the two of you talk it over. Well, I think you're right in the sense that that's certainly the image people have of the two disciplines. I don't know whether it's, <clears throat> whether it's accurate. I think economics is, has more sensibility when done properly than, than that stereotype suggests. In fact, I think we, 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 uh, economics stumbles when it, imagines itself to just be about sense, what Deidre McCloskey would call prudence, uh, prudence only. So I think in that sense, you know, uh, we're, we're better, economists are better when, when, uh, when, we, when we have both, I think. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let that there for right now and then come back to what I think the sense and sensibility in the book is it, why it's interesting to economists. But. I I agree with uh, what you said, Steve, in relation to English departments as well. Mm. I think the humanities and especially English departments are associated with just focusing on uh, beauty and emotion, um, the things that we connect with sensibility. But I think like in Austen's title for her novel, we have to have sense and sensibility. It's not sense or sensibility. Right. And when you separate them, when you emphasize one to um, the extent of excluding the other, I think that's when you run into problems. So I, I think that's something that we actually have in common or our discipline should have in common. Yeah, and, and I think, so what's interesting for me about the title and those two words uh, and about reading the book is it struck me very quickly reading it that this is a book written by someone who must have read Smith's theory of moral sentiments. There's just simply no way, there's just no way that, that you could, that, that you could, especially the contrast between between the sisters is is obviously I think playing off the sense and sensibility, but but also you know Marianne is has doesn't at least the beginning lacks Smithian moderation, and and we we see I think part of what we see early on and and as the book goes on is the importance of that notion of moderation, of having an impartial spectator, of, of adjusting your behavior to those around you, and that you can't just be, uh, um, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of emotionally running off uh, all, all the time. Uh, that that uh, sensibility is great, but it has to be tempered by sense. And there's your, there's your and, not your or. Yeah, the, the term you use, moderation, is, is really interesting because one of the reviews that immediately came out of sensibility, sense and sensibility, 
pointed out that Eleanor has the proper degree of balance between those two qualities, whereas Marianne possesses sense, but she has an immoderate degree of sensibility. Yeah, and that's where she's gone wrong because sensibility at the time meant this indulgence in your emotions. It's, it's not just an appreciation for beauty and the sympathizing with the sufferings of others, but it's, um, it's a response that moves away from social propriety mm -hmm. because the whole idea was that we were born innately good. And so it's society that corrupts us. So if um, you were doing right, you feel that it is right, mm -hmm. which is what Marianne always says, right? If I were doing wrong with Willoughby, I would know it. And Marianne um, always insists on that, whereas Eleanor says, but you have to use your sense and also deal with propriety and what is due to other people. You have to have that prudence. Yeah. It, it also struck me that uh, the propriety is the word that I think overrides almost everything here. And, and it's, it is, of course, somewhat strange to us 200 whatever years later that, that that's so important, right? The, the, the formality and the, cons the constant concern about am I saying or doing the right thing? I have to live up to this particular understanding of what proper behavior is, or I'm supposed to anyway, uh, and, and that in every moment, right, uh, 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 is so important. Uh, again, I think of the time, but also interesting, I thought, reading it now to sort of think about how different we are now and how, how little we care about propriety in that sense. I mean, it doesn't mean we think it's our, our notion of what constitutes good social behavior is more flexible, is, is less formal uh, in ways that I think are, are fascinating here. And to see in particular that Austin <clears throat> makes it such a virtue. It's such a virtue for, for the, for characters to behave that way, even though it often sort of, we, we look and we, we think of them as trapped maybe from our modern perspective in, in certain choices and certain uh, uh, roles. Uh, but for them, that it struck me also reading it that that was a very safe sort of thing to do. It made sure that maintaining that propriety was how you did not get yourself in trouble as we saw with several characters uh, in the novel. Yeah, I was gonna say that Propriety is a lot more, I mean, I think we think of it now as like using the correct fork at a fancy right. dinner, right? Remembering to write thank you notes. It's much more than that here. It's, yeah. it's protective of yeah. some very vulnerable people in some very important ways. Yeah. Um, and we might talk about that, that opening scene um, of Sense and Sensibility, right? Where the, um, the Dashwood family, um, Eleanor, Marianne, their little sister, their mother have lost um, husband and father and thereby lost their home, lost any money that's coming in and are thrown on the mercy of other family members. And we can talk about propriety there and we can talk about what it means to be vulnerable and unprotected in this world where the, the protection you have is following the rules about not running around in the rain or corresponding with young gentlemen to whom you are not engaged, right? Certainly, and that opening uh, really demonstrates the impropriety of Fanny Dashwood's con conduct because, you know, immediately after the funeral, she shows up. It's my house now, right? Mm -hmm. I, run, I run the place, which is so um, extraordinarily insensitive, right? And so the propriety is in place. Um, in order to protect people's feelings and to show people yeah. respect and so that we can all get along. And Eleanor, Eleanor gets this, I think, in a way that Marianne doesn't. Marianne thinks these are social forms. And if you rely on your sensibility, you know what you're supposed to do. Whereas Eleanor knows that the propriety is there to protect people, but maneuvering within those conventions and being respectful to people, you often get what you want more easily. 
than by, you know, going off in the corner and sulking at your piano. The way right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and one way to think about that is that, that uh, propriety is institutionalized in a way that we don't think about it today. That goes back to Sarah's point. It's not just about mere behavioral choices. It's, it's part of the structure of society in the way that Caroline, you were just talking about uh, and knowing how to navigate it, right. Knowing how to navigate that in the institutions associated with propriety becomes, uh, becomes crucial. Uh, and so, yes, I think that's, that's, that's it really important too. One of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about was sort of marriage in this whole thing. Cause there's a, there's, Lots of it going on. Um, and it's interesting. One of the things that struck me as interesting is that the difference between Eleanor and Marianne and the ways that we've been talking about too uh, shows up in their different perceptions of what marriage is. And, and, and interestingly, sort of Marianne's already moving she, her, her, her expectations of marriage and that sort of gauzy, romantic you know, pure sensibility, if you want to think of it that way. Version. You know, she buys bridal magazines, right? Right, like, right. You know, she's like <laughs> modern bride. Right. Well, or pre-modern bride. Yeah. Um, she, she, but, but that's, I think that's, that, that's exactly the point that I was going to make though, which is she, that's a, our understanding of marriage now is much more like hers in terms of those expectations than was the case for most people back then. Uh, and it and it's tied up with this notion of propriety and and that uh, it you know again it's not like you didn't love someone you married but but concerns of prudence were and propriety were ex, were extraordinarily important uh, and uh, and 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 Marianne is already sort of saying no it's it's clearly about whether we love to do the same things right the way when I talk about this with you know historically whatever talk about about the, the compatibility of people's consumption choices. That's how we think about what it means to want to marry someone now. But, you know, for most people, even at the time that Austin was writing, you, that was an indulgence, right? I mean, you, you, marriage was about whether you were compatible in, in a number of, along other dimensions, perhaps not production in a narrow sense, but could you run a household together? Could you, <clears throat> was this the appropriate person to marry given the constraints that we were just talking about before? But, but Mary Ann's already, she's, you know, she's the generation or two ahead wanting something more, you know, more sense more sensibility out of marriage than, uh, than was, well, than was okay to at the time. And especially as Sarah said earlier in the situation they were in, they could not afford to indulge that. And I love the way Eleanor calls Marianne out on that when they're talking about marriage, because Marianne says, well, what does wealth or grandeur have to do with marriage, right? It's all about mm -hmm. the love. And Eleanor mm -hmm. says, what well, has a lot to do with it if you want to eat? Right. Marianne's <laughs> like, all you need is a couple thousand pounds a year. That's an enormous sum. Right. We'll eat, right? We'll eat it. We'll eat our love is what we'll, yeah. you know, we'll, 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 we'll subsist on love. Because how much do they have a year, Caroline? I can't remember off the top of my head. Do you, do you remember? Yes, would women have about 450 a year? Um, together. Together, yeah, together. Right, and that's, enough. it's not enough for a carriage. It's like, you know, they're living in the cottage with the smoking chimney and all that. And, you know, Marianne, she, she's just not using you know, she's not thinking here as well, you know, the love will come with the 2000 pounds and, and Eleanor says, well, my competence is a thousand. Mm. And it's significant that they end up with roughly that amount at the end, yeah. right? With Marianne marrying Colonel Brandon, who has an estate of 2000 a year and Eleanor marrying uh, Edward and together yeah. they have about 850 a year, <laughs> right? But they're, they're pretty well set up, but you can't marry without the money. Right. That's why Willoughby ditches Marianne, which is a yep. whole nother topic. <laughs> Can we talk about Willoughby and how much we loathe him? The cad. I mean, I, I'm not a big Edward Ferrars fan either, I have to say. Uh, well, you know, th my favorite, my favorite criticism of this novel is that people don't like the ending, right? Um, Lady Bessborough, when it came out, said, oh, it ends stupidly. But Jeff Chapman recently has commented on this, and he thinks that Eleanor should have ended up with Colonel Brandon because they both have the sense. 
Instead of, he says that, I'm quoting, insignificant microbe, Edward Ferris. <laughs> I confess I do not see the appeal of Edward Ferrers as a suitor, and I usually see see the appeal of, of Austin's heroes, but I, I just, I don't get him. Um, this may be, uh, this probably is a, a moral failing on my part rather than a, a fault in Austin's novel, um, but but I, I, I confess to not he's see van it. He's vanilla ice cream. He's just, mm -hmm. even, even if you, e even if you want to talk about making a sensible choice, uh, you know, she she had an alternative, and and it does seem to make more sense, as it were, as you're reading along. Um, and there is, a, I think, I, at least for me, at the end, I'm like, mm, you, okay, you'll you'll be fine, but 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 Marianne has a point. <laughs> Marianne has a point, <laughs> right? It shouldn't, you know. It's it's no, it's it's prudence is is good, but not prudence only. Yeah, I mean, I wonder whether some of the dissatisfaction with the matches, as opposed to the ones like I feel like at the end, for me at least, the end of Pride and Prejudice, right? When when Elizabeth and and Mr. Darcy get together, I'm very very satisfied with that. I'm always very satisfied um, at the end of Emma when uh, Mr. Knightley and, and Emma sort of find their way back to being, to being friends and to lovers again. But I wonder if, if there's, there's, there's a dissatisfaction with both of the matches here, right? There's this, this sense that like, yes, okay, Marianne has to marry uh, Colonel Brandon because somebody's got to put some brakes on this kid, right? And he's clearly the one to do it. Right, and then okay, well, we have left over. Then right, we have we have Eleanor and Edward, and that's that's a very sensible match, and it's that's just fine. But we, I don't know that we feel any of the real attraction. No, um, and we're and we're happy. I mean, we're happy that they found someone. We're happy that they're both going to be reasonably, acceptably comfortable materially. But to some degree, maybe we're imposing our own expectations, yeah. right? What are what do your students make of it, Caroline? Because I, I, you teach this, right? So do they think it's romantic? Are they frustrated? What are they, what's their read of the novel? And, and what do you tell them about it? We spend a long time talking about what you just said, because no one's very happy with the ending. And one of my students brilliantly pointed out that the happy part of the ending is that Eleanor ends up at the parsonage just down the street from Marianne yes. at the manor house because the closest bond is actually between the sisters. Yes, that's right. And that, you yeah. know, the, I, the, the marriages that they make, there's a, Austin even, you know, frames it as a kind of conspiracy against Marianne. Everyone is pressuring her to marry Colonel Brandon. And so eventually in time, she comes to love him. But I, I wonder if we're meant to feel dissatisfied with this, if this is a critique of expectations of marriage and that novels have to end this way because it's not satisfying. I don't know anyone who's satisfied with this. I think the point about the sisters is really important. And that was one of my reactions at the end, which was sort of, okay, you, you know, whatever happened here, the family in some sense is still together, right? I mean, it's the, the, the sisters have managed to have the rest of their lives together in some way, right? At least close, close enough proximity. And that seemed, that was a good, to me, that made for a better ending than the marriages did, right? That, that, that at least, you know, sort of, at least they'll have each other still in a way that seems important to the two of them. Um, it certainly pokes some holes in the, uh, preconception I think that a lot of people have about Austen that she's this great you know the the godmother of the romance novel the the you know she that the novels are are super romantic and these pretty clothes and these great bonnets and everybody has tea together and it's all sort of misty kind of pastel romance so now I'm a romance novel fan right so I don't feel the need to you know talk smack about them and and to to say that Austin is the godmother of romance novels doesn't seem to me to be an insult to her but I'm not sure I think it's right um I'm not this sure she's an author I would call romantic and I'm not talking romantic like Byron and Keats and the 
you know, the, the technical literary definition of romantic with a capital R. I'm just, I don't think she's a romantic author. I'm not sure these are love There's, stories, are you? I, 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 the one thing I'll say to go back to the distinction you started us with, Sarah, is there's a hard headedness to this. That is, you know, she's not Austin is is you know putting into her characters this sort of concern about again not just propriety but prudence and practicality. A couple of the p words here, right? To that seems not to fit that romantic vision of her and the gauzy whatever right um there's there's some hard-headedness happening here uh in a whole bunch of different ways not just the choices people are making about potential suitors but but a lot of decisions that characters make here are not made sentimentally right they're made like no we 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 live in a world where those choices matter for material survival so you better make the right one I think Austin's immediate readers picked up on that because we have um, records of, of people like the Prince Regent's daughter, Princess Charlotte, reading this at the age of 15. And so at 15, you know, she's identifying with Marianne and she's writing in a letter about this novel saying, you know, you feel like you're one of the company. And then, you know, with grammar worthy of Lucy Steele, she said, me and Marianne, we're of much the same disposition. Um, I'm not quite so good, but the same imprudence, mm. right? Uh, right, they, they picked up that that was a key virtue that you need in addition to the sensibility that you had to have all of it. And, mm -hmm. and the characters who are evil, right? Like Fanny Dashwood, can we just start with that woman, right? <laughs> she, she's all about the prudent. She's all about the money, but it's always under this screen of sensibility. Or Lucy yes. Steele, who's all about her love for Edward, but it's really a screen for her greed, right? Well, so you don't yeah. want just prudence in the sense of greed, Right. Mm -hmm. You want uh, an ethical prudence balance right. with that sensibility. That's, which is why that early scene where she bargains down the 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 you know what the responsibility that they should have is like is is so uh, you know upsetting or or whatever. Right. She's you know it's pure. It's not prudence isn't even the right word. It's just there's ma there's malice chocolate coated malice there or something right that that as you say she's she's doing it under the guise of 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 doing the right thing but it's it's to, to put a finer word on it it's bullshit right that she's that, you know what she's doing right yeah and i think for austin's readers that scene would have had additional resonance and even for austin herself because over the, the course of the 18th century, when, when families were trying to like raise their name, what happened to the, the dowries of daughters is that percentage-wise, they actually shrank. And so by the end of the century, daughters were actually much more dependent on their brothers and their brothers' families for their financial stability. And so this is a scenario in which Austin is putting that front and center and showing the failure of the family, the failure of the brothers to step up and take care of them because it's easier to listen to Fanny saying, how could you do this to your own son? Would you cheat your son? No. Yeah. Right, and that's why, I mean, that's one reason why it's so important who your sister marries and it's so important who your brother marries and it's so important who your children marry. That's right. Because who's going to take care of those of you who don't manage to make a match? If you don't manage to make a match or who's going to introduce you to people who you can marry, right? I mean. And even if, even if you're not thinking directly in terms of a match, just from a pure sort of uh, level of wealth and society perspective, right? Marriage mattered in a way economically that it matters it mattered more to the rest of the community and family in a way that it doesn't so much today, at least in, in most places. Right. So, so the, 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 you know, everyone's uh, involvement in who married who our friend, Mrs. Jennings, right. Who, you know, uh, who perhaps is my, my favorite little guilty 
you know, pleasure character in here. Um, but she's very concerned about who marries whom. Uh, and, 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 and we, I think the problem is we read it today as, as the kind of, like, she's like a sitcom character, right? She's, she's kind of a classic archetype for us today, the busybody, right? And, but, but, that wasn't irrelevant. I mean, that was not just, you know, there was a role to be played there to make sure that people were making the right marital decisions, even if she was wrong about the details. The concern was a legit one, right? And, and you had to be concerned because if you married the wrong person, not only were you now dependent upon family, but, but the more extended community too. And I think people for, you know, thought they had a stake in who you married for precisely those reasons. And it's as we become wealthier and we're less, the, the marital decision is less of a make or break financially. Other people's concern with who we marry seems now to be not on the table in a way that, that it was back then. Which, you know, I read these and I think I'm so lucky to be alive now because you look at the case of Eliza, the first Eliza that Colonel Brandon brings up, right? Mm -hmm. Her well, marriage yeah. is a disaster. Yeah. She's forced by her uncle into marriage and to, to Colonel Brandon's brother. And it's, you know, it's for her inheritance. And then when she cheats, um, he divorces her and he's essentially got all of her wealth, right? Mm -hmm. And she dies in a poorhouse, an heiress, right? And so the, the you know, the gross inequities um, are really front and center here. And we're, we're getting the, you know, the, the sort of consequences with the second Eliza, right? Um, mm -hmm. this, this keeps playing out. Right. There's always that. I mean, there's so many sort of shadow futures for these women that, you know, and Austin doesn't, doesn't write them those stories. We, we maybe get those stories in sensational novels or, or later on as things get a little more, more gothic and a little creepier and, and weirder, right? But there's always this specter of the fallen woman who's, who's haunting these stories, right? And this specter of the, the woman who's left with nothing, with a, with a child and no way to support it and dies in the poorhouse. And it's always just, it's always just right there, like waiting for these women. And, and Sense and Sensibility much more even than Pride and Prejudice, um, which has a, a strong subplot on the, on, of that, right? But for me, Sense and Sensibility feels much more dangerous in that way. Those, those shadows are a lot stronger for me in Sense and Sensibility, I don't know. Caroline, do you have that same, forgive me, sensibility? <laughs> I do, absolutely. You know, the second Eliza, she should have been an heiress and instead she's very dependent. She's, she's in Bath with her friend, they're partying and she meets Willoughby and goes off with him, right? This, her fate could have been Marianne's fate mm -hmm. because Marianne is, you know, she's devoted to her sensibility. She nourishes it. And what sensibility was associated with at the time was a vulner a sexual vulnerability because you know you do what's right because it feels right so um even though willoughby loves her and we think he he could have married her her fate could easily have been that of eliza it's dangerous it's a mm -hmm. very dangerous novel mm -hmm. And I wonder, and I'd, I'd love to hear uh, Steve, your input on this as an economist. Um, the, the male characters in this, um, I don't like many of them, but they're interesting because Edward and Willoughby are both men who have no profession. They have Well, this is, I, I said to, as I was reading it toward the end, I said to Sarah, nobody has a damn job in this book, <laughs> right? And it's, and there's, I mean, I understand why, right? But, but there's nothing, there's, there's no, one of the things about working for wages or uh, having it as we think of it as a job is, is that it, it it's, it's a, a moderating influence, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it forces you to spend your time doing something and I doing something besides, you know, gallivanting back and forth to London to do what things it's not, you know, <laughs> up to no good in Willoughby's case. Uh, and, and that's, you know, living on the landed estate and living off your capital uh, is, is, is uh, a recipe for bad behavior, it seems to me, or at least a, you know, a, a circumstance that produces a lot of bad behavior. And, and it's going back, you know, the fact that Edward ends up with the parsonage and now actually has something, right? 
is is a good thing and i think that's a you know that keep that will that will keep him that that will keep him in check and and so yeah i think the part, part, there's a relationship between the bad behavior and the sort of uh living living off your often your inheritance or the land or whatever off the you know having the estate um we don't see too many characters except the bit players in the household and so on right who have something that we think of as being today like a job in a way but we don't they're not interesting enough for us to know anything much about them uh, so yeah that's uh yes yeah i think that's that's important i mean colonel brandon had a job he seems to yes. be retired yes um right and and, and and interest and arguably the the best character of the bunch right i mean you know, so, so he, he, yeah, depending on your definition of best character, but yes. yeah, yeah, most yeah, well, right. I mean, most admirable character is what I meant. Yeah. And, and again, the military being not irrelevant to that, I would think uh, as well, but yeah. So, yeah. All right. We've only got about five minutes left guys. So I want to, I want to ask a very silly question, possibly a very silly question and see what you make of it and see if there's anything else you want to pitch into the Caroline, you look surprised that we've, <laughs> gone so quickly <laughs> so a very silly question she, for, she she forgot what it's like when, when <laughs> two of us three of us talk <laughs> i think we've all forgotten what it's like to just yeah, sit no. around in a room with people and no. talk about books that we like yeah. it's, it's been a rough year Not, um no. so at the end of this rough year if you were going to give caroline if you were going to give a present to Steve to read next uh, after Sense and Sensibility, and it has to be from your area, you can't give him an economics book. You have to give him something, you know, English lit. And Steve, you have to give Caroline a present from your specialty that would go nicely with Sense and Sensibility. What would you wrap up and put a bow on for each other? I can ask them this because they've known each other for years and they're very good friends. Well, I, I would give you pride and prejudice. I mean, there's so much to love here, but it's similar themes, especially the vanity and the pride and the prudence, um, but reworked um, with different characters and different personalities. I would absolutely um, do this. And I would also ask you, um, what you think about Michael Choi's analysis of Jane Austen as a game theorist, oh. because he argues that her novels are about strategic thinking and um, that the characters who do best, like Eleanor, um, are the ones who are able to think strategically and to solve problems by thinking about what other people might want yes. and what their goals are. Um, so I have a question. I, have, I would give you two books and, and ask you to, to enjoy Pride and Prejudice and what you think about the game theory. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I know the game theory. I haven't read it, but I know the, the book. And uh, I, I, I didn't think about it while I was reading Sense and Sensibility, but it's I, that ba framed that level generally. I think that's correct. Uh, and I was struck by Eleanor, but other characters too, uh, who Austin clearly writes thinking through the chess match and, and deciding, making their decisions accordingly. And I think that's right. I think, I don't know if I'd call it game theory, but certainly strategic thinking is important. Here. So, well, yeah. So, so what would I give you? I, I think, I mean, so we'll stay with sort of the themes here. I don't think you've read Stephanie Kuntz's book on the history of marriage. And that's, yeah. that is what I would have you read. Um, because it, you, you, it, it would shine some interesting light, I suspect, on all of Austin, uh, but certainly on this book. So M Marriage, a History by Stephanie Kuntz is the one I think I would say, okay, read this and, and that will. I, that book was formative, for, well, for Kathy and me when we were teaching this stuff back in the old days, but certainly intellectually for my thinking about the economics of marriage and, and, and some of the things we've been talking about this morning. That's lovely. Can I, can I add another one? Just one more. Absolutely. Um, uh, there's a, a book, uh, Emma Thompson's screenplay for her adaptation of Sense and Sensibility, which is amazing, not only in shedding light on um, how 
she wrote the screenplay and the, the directions, but it also includes fabulous tidbits, like um, the director only asking all of the actors to get into character by writing letters in character. So like Imogen Stubbs of Lucy Steele uh, writing to Eleanor after their marriages and like really rubbing it in her face that she, she's nobody. They're, they're delicious, but they're also really illuminating because the, you know, it was originally a novel in letters, but, but they're just so much fun because Emma Thompson just really gets um, well Austin. So if you can't let go of a sense and sensibility yet, this is another great one. Well, we want, we watched the film before I read the book, which was good, actually. I, I think it helped me read the book much more effectively, but I couldn't. I mean, there was a few, you, the, the male actors more than the female, I couldn't get out of my head as being the character. I mean, Hugh Grant in particular is like absolutely the dullest dishwater Hugh Grant, right? Even for Hugh Grant. And that was, you know, perfect. And I couldn't, couldn't shake that out of my head. Um, yeah, when she imagines Willoughby riding in, it's an Adonis on a white horse. <laughs> it's great, but it's yeah. it's a modern translation right. of how glamorous Willoughby right. is. When right. He Marianne. Yep. yep. Especially when, you know, like Marianne, you, you have basically nothing. Right. I mean, every, everything has been taken from you. You're in, you know, we look at the, the cottage in the film particularly like, oh my, it's so cute. It's so charming. I want to live in it. But, it, and I doubt very much that the, the cottage that Austin imagined for them was very much like the cottage that we see filmed. I expect yes. it was much uh, less appealing uh, much less shabby chic and much more well, shabby, right? And so when this guy just comes out of the mists, like something out of every teenage girl's fantasies, right? You know. Which, which oh, makes me but, think of another recommendation, which if you haven't seen it, have you seen, Carolyn, uh, 1900 House? No. The, oh, okay. So I'll do, do, I know we're short on time. 1900 House was a British series, uh, from 1999, where they uh, took a, a British family of five or six and had them live as if it were 1900. They refurbished a house uh, to 1900 specifications. It turned out the guy was in the military so he could keep his job. And, and the kids had to, everyone had to dress and do everything as cl I mean, close to 1900 as possible. It, you, you can find it. It's all four hours worth are out on YouTube. You can find it. But it's it is worth watching. It's obviously later than Austin, uh, but I kept thinking, watching the movie and then reading the book about the cottage, I'm going, no, nah, no, nope, no. Nope. <laughs> this place was dirtier. It was smellier. Uh, we don't even, we're, we're not even talking. No one, no one in this book is doing the laundry because, I mean, the servants are, right? But, but, no, but we don't even, all that invisible, it's the same problem we have with Star Trek going into the future, right? All the stuff that, is interesting to me about how people live day to day is invisible, right? In, in the novelization, but that, but I, you're right. I mean, the point about the house is important, right? On the, in the movie. And then when you read it after seeing the movie, you have the romantic version of that cottage. And, you know, the historical reality was that was, you know, it was a house, but yeah, it wasn't, uh, wasn't anything, it couldn't be anything special. Uh, and it would have been really a challenge. So, so yeah, 1900 House, if you can, if you can find it out on the web. Uh, if not, I, I think I, I have it on VHS somewhere. Somebody still has a VHS player. <laughs> and there is a book that goes with it too that you can Speaking find. Speaking of like antique technology. Yes, indeed. So anyway, that'd be another great thing to watch. Clearly, I need this uh, for myself and for my students, for my class. This would be oh, really you will. I, I've used 1900 House uh, in my econ and gender class uh, every time I've taught it, basically. It is it's it is powerful for the students and fun. So, yeah. Well, Steve and Caroline, I, I don't want to stop talking to you guys because this has been absolutely spectacular. But I do need to finish this up. And I want to thank you both for your time. Uh, and for uh, being willing to grab some time at a very busy time of the year to reread some Austin and spend some time thinking and talking about it with all of us. I think that we are all going to be looking forward to the future television show you guys are going to be hosting where you just recommend books to each other yeah. to read because yeah. I would watch the heck out of that. We'll call it <laughs> Sense and Sensibility. Even. Yeah, it might work. <laughs> it has a nice ring to it. Um, <laughs> thank you 
both for your time. Uh, we spent today talking about Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility with Steve Horowitz and with Caroline Brashears. And thank you both so much for being here. It's really been a joy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank, thank you, Caroline. Good to see you as always. It's, lovely. it's a pleasure seeing you both. Thank you.